que también haya interpretación al inglés. Este, cuando se eh, habilite esa función, le va a aparecer en la esquina inferior derecha de su pantalla para que también puedan escuchar en inglés. Si bien el evento en sí es virtual, cada uno de nosotros participa desde un lugar per perteneciente a pueblos originarios, la región que hoy conocemos como las Américas. Para aquellos y aquellas de nosotras que no somos indígenas, nos animo a aprender más sobre en qué territorios estamos. Compartiremos un recurso, un recurso en el chat que les permitirá encontrar esta información y aprender más sobre la historia y las realidades actuales de las comunidades indígenas cuyas tierras ahora llamamos hogar. A lo largo de la conversación tendremos la oportunidad de aprender sobre los esfuerzos de los, de los pueblos originarios y cómo podemos apoyarles. Nos alegra que hayan decidido acompañarnos para conversar sobre la historia colonial de Latinoamérica, cómo esos ideales continúan dominando en la actualidad y cómo las organizaciones lideradas y al servicio de personas indígenas están cuidando sus comunidades, su idioma y sus prácticas culturales. Nuestro panel está compuesto por Senaida Cantú, parte de la organización Red de Pueblos Transnacionales, una red de grupos de personas indígenas e inmigrantes que viven en la ciudad de Nueva York y que trabajan para promover la inclusión y los derechos culturales, sociales y económicos de los pueblos originarios. Senaida es originaria de la colonia El Obispo, municipio de Malinaltepec, por la montaña alta de Guerrero, México. Viene de una familia... She comes from a family of farmers with a Kabaneko language. Since we were, she was very young, she had to really force to for school supplies, but it never stopped her. And working, uh, despite of her difficult and circumstances, these same circumstances forced her to migrate to a country that was totally different to her home in the mountain Guerrero. When she reached the United States, she got involved in an effort with the objective of supporting her indigenous populations. Years later, she's an essential part of many efforts that take place in New York and the rest of the countries to support the efforts of indigenous populations, especially ling linguistic efforts and access to interpretation services. Besides, the, despite the challenges that she faced on the road for the indigenous, indigenous populations, these motivate her. Thank you for joining us, Senaida. We also have the participation of Luis Lopez Resendiz, director of Cielo programs and a proud Nazarí, a self-name for several people of several communities, Oaxaca, Guerrero, and Puebla, Mexico, that means people from the rain. Luis works to defend the rights of the indigenous people and guarantee that their voices are in spaces where often they are not, they are underrepresented studies interdisciplinary studies in Berkeley University and is a very talented poet whose work has been exhibited in the Center for Race and Gender in the California University of Berkeley. Karen is the representative of the podcast that, um, that promotes the voice of the indigenous people. We structured the conversation starting with three questions. I would like to remind the assistants that you might you can do questions in the chat or this question and answer part. Like I mentioned previously, I'm really glad that you decided to accompany us in this important conversation. And the public knowledge has been historically told by the colonizers and the descendants. The behaviors that took to the genocide of 56 million indigenous people throughout a hundred years in the South, Southern, Central, and Northern part of America, in many parts are represented as the least atrocious than they actually were. And this erroneous representation has contributed to the discrimination and misrepresentation of the indigenous people. For these people, in, in America, we can identify as Latin, Latin America, it's very important to address how our beliefs and colonial practices have made us accomplices, if not uh, active particip participants in discrimination of indigenous people. We are witness of this when we, we made it public, the conversation between councilmen of Los Angeles City making racist, racist comments of indigenous people with roots in Oaxaca, Mexico. I'm using this particular example because these members of the municipal council identify themselves as Latin people and their behavior 
highlighted the racist behaviors suffered by indigenous people. I would like to invite Luis to join this conversation of the Latin American version and how it's related with the evolution of Latinity. Then I'm going to invite Zenaida, the concept, how he raises the concept for Latin American. Luis, welcome. Hello, welcome, colleagues. Good afternoon. Like my colleague Jimena mentioned, my name is Luis Lopez Resendiz. I'm the, the Nisakta community. And currently, I'm in Tomba territory, which is the original population here in Los Angeles, California, within the Mexico consulate. We are we're about to celebrate a, an event in response one year after the racist comments that were recorded from the Los Angeles councilmen that were involved in these types of these types of racist comments, homophobic comments against the indigenous community and other communities that were also impacted, including the black community. From that point of view, I would like to begin this conversation because precisely today we are celebrating 531 years of indigenous resistance. I would like to name a historic incident with the idea of the European colonizers in this part of the world. And from there, we would like to invite you to rethink what it means to be what we celebrate in this country as this quote unquote discover, discovery of America or Christopher Columbus, as he's called in English, and think of the indigenous communities, not as communities that suffer, that live ignorant, that need, no, need anybody else to speak for them, but think of them as communities and towns that have their own voices, that are in resistance, and that are here present today. They, the, the campaigns to eradicate us were not successful, and we are here. Think about Inheritance Month and Hispanic Inheritance Month. Think about it as a month which symbolizes the imposition of an identity, of a story, and the campaigns to want to erase the history of the indigenous populations. Here in Cielo, we see this day as a day of resistance, and we invite everybody to see in that way, not to think about uh, the indigenous population as, as survivors to have uh, some genocide campaigns. And now we are here present. When we talk about what it means to be, what it means, this colonization and those systems that were imposed, I would like to talk about the case system. That is all based, this, this entire history is based, and all these systems are based on the indigenous community and that were imposed on the story that was that we learned in the, in the classrooms. I would like to share a story when I went to Mexico. I was born in the northern part of Mexico due to the migration of my, pop, of my community to the city and the school, the school that I went to was called Juan José Reyes Martínez, who, those who don't know who Juan José Reyes Martínez, he's the one that put his stone during the Battle of France to open the Chapultepec Castle, which is where, when the French were beaten. In the afternoon, he was called José Vasconcelos. In the school, it was for the, in the morning, the school was for the indigenous population, and then during the afternoon, the school was for the non-indigenous population when we, this story as the father of the education in Mexico that presents this idea in front of the world or in front of the Mexico, that Mexico is an identity, it's a unique identity, it's a mixed identity, it's a nation, it's called like the golden race or the bronze race here for the United States. And it presents this idea, imposing a system or a belief that the indigenous population and the black populations didn't exist in Mexico. From that point of view, it's very important to try to redistribute what has been written or to give it a space for the indigenous communities to tell our own stories. Personally, I don't identify myself 
as a Hispanic person, I identify myself as a as a Nazi person, or when I talk about in terms of political identity, I don't see myself as an indigenous person. And because it was this was created by the United Nations, but it was adopted by the the people of the indigenous communities that rise up in protest against this identity that we recognize them as Latin, Hispanic, or against the story that they want to sell us that that we all are mixed or descendants from the Spanish colonizers. This is something that I want to share when I talk about being mixed. It means that, well, well, well the whiter your skin, unfortunately, the color of my skin in Mexico, it might, might dictate the privileges that I might have. So the whiter my skin is, the more privileges I have in the social structures that was imposed in Mexico and in other Latin American countries that unfortunately, with migration of, of many of the Latin migrants and from other countries, those ideas migrate towards these countries and are reproduced. And we're going to be speaking about this in the letter later on. Thank you very much, Luis. And Zenaida, go ahead. Yes, hello. Good afternoon. Good evening to everybody, wherever you are joining from, regardless of the hour. My name is Zenaida Cantu. I'm from La Montaña Alta in Guerrero, a small population called Lo Obispo. Like Jimena mentioned, I come from a, fam a very humble family. My parents are farmers. Through my experience from my own population, this has driven me to continue pushing forward, pushing this to that, my, that our, all of our rights are respected, all of us, even though we come from a small town. And in this country, ever since I arrived, I've seen many things that, that are totally different. Like in my town, in the, in the city life, it's much more different. For me, when we speak about decolonization, we talk about resistance, and it's actually something that has motivated me a lot through my experiences here in New York City of how people, the indigenous people, how they survive, how they connect with their land being far away it doesn't matter if we are it doesn't matter if we're far away from our own land we, we always have something within us that we identify with this connection with the land connection with mother nature we never lose that custom of that somebody arrives here and we miss everything back home we find a way to see how we can have things delivered back from home things that we would eat back then it's something that I feel that, that many of us that we do and, and how these power people leave, how these people arrive in this country and they arrive here and they have a different type of treatment and how their rights are infringed upon when they do their work. They don't have access to information where we, as part of that these indigenous groups, which we we push them forward and to drive them so that they, their rights are respected, the rights of the migrant people, how we inform them, how we have this connection with these people, people that I think it's something that's very important. And it's the, the very first time that I'm invited to this kind of event, because for me, I would see it from far away. And, and on my part, like you mentioned, it's, there are people that have more experience, but I might explain throughout through my experience how I have grown here, how I've connected with people here, with my own community here in New York City. And at the same time, this has driven me forward to, to prepare myself to develop and be able to develop my own skills, to be able to tell my own people that they can also they can do everything that we think we are possible doing. If we think that we're not worth it, then to stop thinking that way, that, that people, not just people from the city, that is what they've gotten us used to, 
starting from school that you're not able to, you're not capable of doing it because you can't speak another language. So who's going to pay attention to you? That's what they've made us believe. But I can honestly say that, that today I can I find myself to have this link, to be able to dialogue and say here in, United, here in New York City, there's interpretation for the indigenous communities so that they are valued, so our languages are valued, so besides just Spanish and English. So this is what I can contribute as an indigenous woman. So thank you to these people that have extended a welcoming hand to me as an indigenous woman, because we, they don't normally don't give us this access or because they don't see us as capable of doing so. So I think that for me, it's something, it's a privilege. And especially with my group that I'm always with the original communities. And so we have different dialogues with every agency. We also have, it's also a, we achieved that there was a special window in the Mexican consulate office, a window for the indigenous population. So they receive a more fair treatment that they previously would not receive this treatment because so many people were complaining. But nowadays we are following up on what's, what occurs in the special window, which is where our people can be tended to in this special window. Thank you very much, Senaida. And thank you, Luis. I think that's precisely why it's very important to learn the story from the perspective of people that come from the original. I know that many focused on resilience and how they shown it throughout history. So I would like to continue the conversation in that sense. Can you tell us about resilience in your family, in your community, and you yourselves? How do you keep your language alive, your identity, your culture in a society that is constantly trying to erase it? Yes, Senaida, you can go ahead first. Well, thank you once again. Well, honestly, to maintain our language alive, it's just to keep doing the work that we're doing, knocking on every door, saying, here we are, and that we speak a language that is before the pandemic, many people from here in New York City, I can speak on my experience here in New York City, many people didn't know about us. They didn't know if, that we are the majority that are here in the city, in New York City, uh, especially everybody that, that worked hard, that can do those kinds of jobs, even they themselves, they're surprised with our communities because these are people that are, are very resilient, they are capable, they, they don't complain when they do this work. So this is where we could say, or we could reach the city and say, we're coming from a small town, we speak in, a, in an indigenous language, but this is where they could recognize and we're also, people started to get to know, to recognize our languages and especially to maintain that language alive and maintain this with our children as well, to keep wearing our traditional clothing. Many times it's difficult to live in a city this big to dress exactly how we are. You know, people from small towns, but also to always speak our language. It doesn't matter the place, it doesn't matter where we go, where we speak these languages, because this is the only way we can keep this language alive. And this is how we can give greater value to our languages, so, so it maintains the life for the future generations. Thank you. Thank you, Senaida. I would like to say that for me, it's an honor to be able to be sharing this space with my colleague, Senaida. For those that don't know, the work of transnational communities, also the work that's being done in New York City, I would recommend that you find out more about this work because it's very important work in such a big city that it is like New York City to have colleagues that are that are doing this. This kind of work is, is very important. 
being, uh, being one of the most diverse cities when it comes to culture in the entire continent. So a virtual applause for Sanaida and for the team that works with her. I would like to mention in this part that to speak about how we how we are resilient, how we maintain our density alive. This is through the community organization. The region from which my Sanaida comes from is a. Uh, it's not very far away from. We actually share the region, which uh, the Mesteca region, which is within between Guerrero, Pueblo, and Oaxaca. I think that we come from the same communal practices, the same organization, different languages, different ways of thinking, and different ways of interpreting the migration of indigenous communities. From there, I think it's very important to mention that when we migrate to this country, for example, we don't do it individually, we do it in a collective fashion, just like Senaida has many compatriots from her, from her town, you know, and living in Bronx and other neighborhoods in New York City, the same thing happens for the mixed echo towns that migrate to California. What I want to mention that your resistance of the organization starts from home, starting with the language that I speak in our own homes. I was still using the mixed echo language as our native language. Rare, we rarely speak in Spanish. And when I say rarely, it's because it's just us youngsters together. So they had to speak to me in Spanish. So starting from there, we start to, to we start to create to, uh, an, uh, an identity. We start to create our traditions, our culture, so that they still, they stay alive. And my colleague is not gonna let me lie. This all begins at home, starting from the food that we eat, she also mentioned the food, that, the clothes that we wear. We wear, they're called huaraches, and, and in the way we preserve our identity. But also, the, also the, the the celebrations, celebrations that we have. I mean, the celebration is where we, it's where we, we enforce the most resistance. It's where we meet with the rest of our uh, members of our communities. So we celebrate the patron saint that we might have. And I mentioned this because many times was, there's this conversation that we adopt these religions that come from very far away. But for us, it's, we adopted them in a way to, in order to survive. So the story behind the patron saint of my community, there's a spirit that's being protected. So we use religion to hide, those, hide the beliefs behind it. So when we talk about these practices, we talk about them in a different manner. Precisely a week ago, we finished celebrating the traditional celebrations of my community. And we do it with the rituals to for the rain to arrive. As next people, we, we do a ritual which we which we were exposed to since we were very young. How do we want the rain to arrive? How do we ask to have good harvests? How do we ask for our members of a community to arrive safely home. So this all passes from a generations. And again, from my, something that I, it, it was passed on to me from my grandparents to my identity. I think from there, it's very important to mention that, that this, this resistance is something that's a collective effort. It's not done individually. It's not something that we think about. We think about the common good of everybody. How we, the collective manner in which, the way, how we share this with the rest of the communities. When we, so when we speak about the collective work of the CL, of the CL organization, we do our best as possible to safeguard the indigenous languages, to give an, an indigenous migrant the option of receiving a fundamental right, which is knowledge of knowing what's happening around us. And based on that, to 
based on, on these materials, we try to conserve our identities and the languages. So I think this practice is not, it's not exclusive to indigenous communities. These are practices to, to the communities that are in the diaspora because nowadays we are, we are living proof that we able to resist that for over 500 years we've managed to survive and just to give a, a historical idea in the i study history in the university so i like i like history our community has 8000 years of history when the spanish colonists arrived and all of them all of them marked a specific period a codex which marked 1000 years per history of history so when we talk about and we start get together and talk about what is what are these 500 plus years what do they represent they represent an historical accident because the following 500 years that passed after this these are just an accident so there's also the story that is told the the ancient the ancient members of our towns they would get together and talk about the stories stories that were passed down through generations to the communities that are still alive nowadays so i think it's important not to not to celebrate just today but we should celebrate this every day that we have this this identity and this language is still alive even though we're far away from home thank you very much louise and thank you very much Zenaida. we have interest from the audience to get to know from, we would ask which organizations you're coming from. Luis comes from Cielo, located in Los Angeles, California, and Zenaida is based in New York. We're gonna share the links to their websites in the chat. And also I would like to remind the audience that you can ask us questions in the chat or in the question and answer section. We're gonna use the final 10 minutes of the question to answer these questions, but before we read that part, I would like to, one final question. How can the people that are not indigenous, specifically the people, the Latin people, how can they better allies to you? What could they do? And Zenaida, go ahead. I'm always first, thank you. No, no, Luis, go ahead, your turn. Thank you, Zenaida. I think that this webinar is a very, a great example of what can be done, creating a space to give an opportunity to, to the indigenous communities to the, in the, so that they're able to share their experiences. Like we would say, give a step back. So that those that, those, those communities that have not been given the opportunity that they can take a step forward. And there are many spaces and also this occurs in many universities and academic spaces, and it's translated into other spaces that are not academic, where somebody is an expert, is a quote unquote, an expert of a community, of a community they were born in. The same thing happens in several spaces where the people that are not indigenous, they wanna speak on behalf of the indigenous communities because they don't think we have our own thoughts, because they don't think we can produce our own content and that we're incapable of having our own thoughts or critical thoughts in front of, in the face of the situations that are taking place in the world because of the, So create a space for them and maybe work in an organization that provides these types of services for migrants, or if you work in the migration sector, create a space to see if, if there are people that are interested in receiving these services see if there are indigenous communities. And if you work in a nonprofit or a human rights organization, see if you have a logistics plan to access to these languages and or if not start from there and start to give space to, to people in their own language. Just to add, there's a very mistaken idea that I would really like the people that are listening to get rid of the idea that everybody that comes from the southern part of the Mexico, that everybody speaks Spanish. That's the worst mistake they can make, that everybody that arrives from Mexico to the US speaks Spanish. Because in Mexico, there are 68 indigenous languages with three, over 300 variants. 
in Guatemala, there's another population that have many migrants. There are 22 Mayan languages of the 32 have spoken entire world, besides Garifuna as well. So this idea that we all speak Spanish is the worst idea we can make. So starting from there, create a space so we can have linguistic access for indigenous communities. Yes, is it my turn? Yeah. Yes, yes, go ahead, Senator. Well, thank you for that question. It's a very important question for me. Uh, first of all, because of my, my nerves, I, I forgot to say thank you to those that invited me. We really worked together. And, and before that, for me, it was hard to believe that the network was actually doing this. So I was, I could, I could actually see with my own eyes the work that they were doing because of their interest for the community, indigenous communities. So I'm part of the council of the original communities. So we all work together when there is that need to reach every agency. They receive support, and this is we're always working side by side, and I'm part of different collectives with the Colibri and also with the Alliance of Languages that are in danger of extinction. So these are also people that I, I, I really thank them for giving me this opportunity for myself as an indigenous woman, that it's difficult for us to, us to receive access for this type of work because it's not easy for me, for me to be able to, to speak on behalf of my people, on behalf of my town, this type of pen. So the people that don't speak an indigenous language or are not indigenous, especially I would say that I would ask that that if they are actually if they actually are interested in supporting us, then we should end in that bureaucratic system of the government because for us the indigenous people, it's very difficult for us to because I've lived it from my, in my own experience here. Every time there are projects we do projects and we work in different projects with, with the health department and we work in another, in this case, when we do the interpretation services, it's very difficult to receive payments because of small requirements demanded by them. So this is where I would ask these people that if they do have access in a manner in which we can, they can support us or drive even more forward so we can have the same rights as the other people that, that in which we speak in a different language and like like my colleague Reese, Reese mentioned and yes and it's an organization that I'm very thankful for because they've given me the opportunity to actually develop my skills as an interpreter because we, to be able to work with the indigenous people and spoken from his own experience so I think it's it's where we can actually have access that's what I would ask for the people like they mentioned how many languages over 300, 368 languages because many have been lost due to different circumstances so and it's one of the things that, that the people that are not indigenous or the people from different agencies they don't know they aren't aware that there are variants within the languages for them it's either it's therefore it's just handful of languages however they aren't aware if there are variants in those languages in which we can know what's that began this, this struggle. Besides, besides promoting this, we have we're also we have to say there's such and such community and such variant in the language. So these are things that the people people that don't speak this language, they are completely unaware of this. So that's what I would ask. If they do have access to help us in that sense. Thank you very much. No, thank you, Senaida, and Luis as well. Definitely, we all have responsibility, and especially when we have the power to, to give them a platform to these indigenous communities. We have an, a very interesting, an audience that is very interested in receiving answers. We received some questions that I would like to share with you. You can answer the both of you or just one. 
whoever is comfortable. This one says, as a part of the rec recognition process, do you see that as a reivindication, a important reivindication to be included in the U.S. and Mexico Mexico census? I don't know if my colleague, if he wants to answer. Go ahead, Luis. Thank you. I think it is important to be included and to have the option of be able to identify ourselves as such. I think there's here, at least, at least in California, they're taking a step forward for this type of recognition. The census is, is barely beginning. Well, not barely, because in California, the first indigenous family that was recognized under the US, the US census was in 1990, if I'm not mistaken, if I'm not mistaken regarding the year. It was a mixed family in the Central Valley of California that wrote down in the, in the census, I miss that quote. So that's where a conversation begins. So it's important that this, that this recognition exists because if you see the census in some parts, if you aren't, if you, if you write that you are Latin American or Latino or all those classifications, you have to force to be right white. So it's, I'm not white, but there's no, there's no checkbox that says Mixteco. There is an option for indigenous, but it's not a specific one that says Mixteco. So it's a, that's going to be important because that defines the resources that are assigned to each community in each town in the United States. So it is important. In Mexico, one can name out of designate themselves as, so you can categorize yourself as indigenous, and you can say that I do speak my language, but we're working on that here in the United States, and we hope that it takes place soon, and I do think it's important. Well, now it's, I'm going to answer as well. I think it is important on both sides of my case, because it's a question that I think sometimes we ask ourselves this question. Why aren't we taken into consideration as we should be? And it has to do with the same thing, because when the questions, when the census takes place, it's where we, Hispanic or Latin, there's no, it's all those only options, Hispanic or Latino. There are no other, there's no other box for us to check where we can identify ourselves that way. These are topics that are very broad in which we could, that there are, that we would ask that there be a specific question for the people that speak indigenous languages or people come that come from an indigenous community. In Mexico, honestly, I could say that and it's not that I, I'm against the politicians there or something like that. In Mexico, they don't, they're not interested in saying how many of us are here or what we're doing or how we live. They don't care about anything. I'm just saying it, talking in my state, my states. Maybe they don't even know how many people, how many of us are migrating on a daily basis. It's also where we can we don't even know if resources that are designated for us. We think it's something that's very important for us. Something that's very specific for us. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Zenaida and Luis. I think it's a very important question because there's many recognition for the experiences of the people are based on the census, how people are categorized and things that they are based on their experiences. So I think it's, I appreciate both of your answers. We received a, something that was directed to Luis, but I would ask tonight that if she wants to contribute as well. The question is, Luis, you previously mentioned homophobia in the conversation. Can you talk about how the indigenous people or trans or queer people 
are navigating their lives in these spaces, how are they treated within the indigenous community? For this, I think it's important to mention that these are different, different contexts within the indigenous communities. What happens in my community doesn't mean it's necessarily happening in the other one as well. What I have seen in my community, not, not that deep of a context, there's no definition in our language for man and woman. There's no definition for gender. It's not, it doesn't exist in our language. When we talk to each other, it's about, there's a way in which we refer to each other. It's just you and I are the same people. So when we talk about a person that is trans, we use a term that is, we talk about two people that live within the same person. So, in my community and the communities around us, it all depends on the families and the context within the families. They are accepted, but they are defined as, how should I explain this, two, essence, two spirits within the same person. And this is how this is introduced into a community or the community accepts them. This does not mean that this happens in all the rest of the communities. There are other more conservative communities, others might be more open. But what I mentioned is what happens specifically in my community. Well, and I, also, I can also say that in my community, and the community in New York as well, reality, community in those times, Back to my times of my grandparents, it was difficult for the people that they would speak about this for us because the grandparents or the people are so accustomed that is it because of because of their traditions or the customs that they have. There's no that type of manner does not exist. It's something that a man, man, woman, woman. I know it's a complex topic. You know, being in this country or being with people from different cultures, but I'm speaking from on behalf of my people, my community. It's very difficult to say because, first of all, the parents are not accepted. And you can't say it simply so if you're a man or a man or a woman or a woman. So it's difficult to say that I'm used or something on those lines because the, the person I received blows for saying that. For me, it's very difficult to speak on this part because these are simply the, I'm just speaking of the reality of what my population, like my community. And New York, we haven't seen this in, in our communities of these words or this part of what is spoken nowadays. Thank you very much. Thank you, and thank you for the question. I think it's important to address this topic and remind both of you that the, the word in English is monolith, which the indigenous communities, they're not all the same. So it's important to learn about these specific experiences. We have many questions. The good thing is that we have plenty of time. So I would like to do the next question that says, question, is there any initiative to teach indigenous languages as a second language in the United States educational system in any place within the United States? Yes, yes there is. For example, here in, in the Los Angeles school district, there are some groups, some, some schools in a specific neighborhood, but there's many of the Central American communities. Are, there's a study group that is doing the effort so that there could, there could be a specific class where us as an organization as Cielo, so our colleagues that speak the Maya Quiche language, they can teach that language for the reinvindication of the Maya 
P2 language, but there are other spaces in the San Diego State University where they teach Mixteco. And the same way there are other spaces, I know that there are some schools that are in Oregon where it's a very big, big concentration of Mixteco population. Children that aren't Mixteco, they're learning to speak this language to identify and be able to communicate with the Mixteco kids. So yes, there are some spaces in different different districts, different school districts throughout the United States. Here in New York, I'm sorry, here in New York, we have a, a linguist that teaches the languages. And as a matter of fact, there's a project that we were doing was spreading our language, which is the health information, working along with the Department of Health. So we work and we transcribe it to our language, which is Latin, Mija, Mixteco, Nahua. So we do have a place where we can do this, but also we had this opportunity to be able to teach the children with teach the children the Mixteco language. I've heard that in certain schools there are people that are giving these classes in their in the Nahua language and Mixteco, if I'm not mistaken. So yes, thank you. Thank you. Very good questions from the audience because it allows us to give examples of what we can do. For example, this is a great example of the efforts that are being in process. And that if we see that if our schools, if our universities are within the same space, that they're not replicating, then there is an opportunity to actually create a change because possibly this effort might be from indigenous people how they can be supported with their local community. So thanks to both of you for giving us this information. We received another question. It's more focused on Mexico. The question says, how do you see the support from the indigenous communities in Mexico, specifically from the government, but precisely the people? Would you like to give a more a context that's focused more in Mexico itself? Well, Let's say there in Mexico, it's still a country that it does recognize the indigenous population, recognize the different international treaties, treaties with OIT, the Declaration of the Indigenous People in Mexico. There is so far there's, there has been no government that is as respecting our autonomy of the indigenous populations. There are different. There's a Congress, national congress for the indigenous people that was promoted from apartheid movements that still that still respects the self-determination of the people. There's still a long way to go. Right now, there's a president that says that first the poor people and the indigenous people, however, he decided to build mega projects in indigenous communities like the ill-conceived called Maya train, there's a the Morelos comprehensive project in Morelos. So this has been, this has caused even more displacement of the Maya communities. We've seen people seeking political asylum where these projects are located. So there's still a lot more to do, a long way ahead. And when we speak about the support from the people, I think we're still, we're still in the exact same place because there's no support that the people are not inclusive. They don't recognize that in Mexico, racism exists in Mexico. When you speak about racism in Mexico, it's not exactly racism, but instead it's a class warfare. That it's not people, it's not rich against the poor when it's actually, it's discrimination or racism against the indigenous community. We see the people like, Yalitza, the Seca actress, that was discriminated simply because she was indigenous. So I still using this idea that marry somebody that's whiter than you so you can surpass the race. So there's still a lot of work to do. Lots of decolonization, lots of internal work. 
the executive director of Cielo mentioned that in some conversations that the people they don't like they don't like the indigenous people when we're quiet or when we dance, we do the ceremony. They don't like an indigenous person that's a politician that's critical and has a critical thought or independent thought against or question certain racist behaviors that exist. So we think there's a lot of work that has to be done still. Yes, it's true. Um, I agree completely with my colleague. We are living in our own experience that we are, and it's not enough for us. There is no support that we can say that we have specific, the resources that are specifically for the indigenous people because we haven't seen them. The only one that might exist for our people is a great support and of opening this special window and for them to be able to go there and receive dignified treatment as it should be because, because they suffered so much discrimination. The people that were working there are, are working within the consular offices. They would mistreat them. They would see them as less than they were because or because of the, they had a different color of skin. So I think that that was total discrimination against us. So little by little, they, they found out that there was actually somebody that was really defending them. That started to cause a change, but there is no specific resource like, this is for you because you are working or you're doing this, or, or that we have knowledge regarding this. And the support that I could say is there's still a lot to do because Oh, because since you're earning money over there or because you're doing this, when honestly, it's in my own experience, being in this struggle, in this fight, speaking on behalf of these towns, I don't want to speak about just my own town. I speak on an international level because here, many of us are cohabiting with different cultures from Guatemala, from Ecuador, from Honduras. So we're such a big community of indigenous people. So that's why I'm not saying if I if I have a resource to do something or you can you yourselves can see this. It's not the resource that I'm doing. And I, I enjoy doing it because here I can express what we really what my community really needs. Thank you very much. So, thank you. And we still have three more minutes. I'm going to have one more question because I think it's a good way to finish this conversation has to do with acti cultural activities that you might have planned from your organization or that you're aware of so that the people can go there and learn more about the, the history and the realities of the indigenous communities in these events. It can be an opportunity to self-promote any event that you are planning, that your organizations are planning. Well, I think it will be important that if you're ever in Los Angeles, that you come visit our offices. There are some some events that we organize. I'm thinking about in the Indigenous Literature Conference. We have writers that change the narrative regarding the content creators we also see it organizes. There's a, a rap concert in indigenous languages. Follow us on social media, and there are other events that you can participate. And it's important that that you get to know that when one one participates in these events, that they don't want to take over. It's that they want to consume. They want to consume this indigenous culture. So I think that Cielo and Pueblo Network. They do lots of work that can, we can learn from it. Many of them are virtual, other ones can be take things like this one, so we can all keep learning more about it. Yes, uh, thank you for that. Uh, yes, there are many things that can, that can be learned in New York. As a matter of fact, the network of, of people, many, they always publish them in activities that take place here. We also have colleagues that are teaching the music class, 
and the colleagues that are that get organized to also the October 28th, we have uh, the Day of the Dead Parade. For those of us that know it through the, it's in the 146th Street in Bronx, New York. That's where we're located. So for anything that you need, or you can visit our website and you can see all the information, all the events that are organized. So for anything you need, just visit us there. Thank you very much. No, thank you. Well, as you know, he uh, follows Cielo and Network of Pueblos in their social media to catch up on their activities that have taken place or things are getting organized. And with that, we reached the end of our meeting. Before we finish, I want to thank our panelists for lending their time and their energy for this time. And also thank you very much to the audience for worrying about this topic. I invite you to know more about these organizations by visiting our websites, which you're gonna share in the chat. And with that, I wish you a good afternoon and good evening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye.